Hi, my name is Jason Harlow. Uh, this pre-class video will be finishing off chapter 9 of Wolfson. Okay, so the sections are listed there, but I'd like to actually start with the quote above, which is a collision is a brief, intense interaction between objects. External forces are negligible compared to the force of the objects on each other. So the total momentum is conserved in collisions. But you can have momentum transferred from one, from one object to another. So I want to show you an example video. It's up there. Uh, it's paused right now, but what's going to happen is the guy on the right, the larger guy, is going to do a chest bump with the guy on the left. So let's watch. Boom! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chaos ensues. And of course it's on a loop, so you can watch it again and again. Alright, so let me tell you the sections. Uh, impulse and momentum. We want to do the impulse momentum theorem. Energy and collisions. That's how we classify collisions. Uh, totally inelastic collisions is a big example, and then we'll end up with elastic collisions, and that'll, that'll finish the chapter. Okay, so I want to start by defining impulse. So collisions involve a large force, usually, exerted over a small amount of time. But it turns out that both the force, the amount of force, and the time are important. And in fact, it's the product. The, uh, when you multiply the force times the time, that's how much the momentum changes by. So we actually define impulse as, as force times time, and that's going to be uh, a vector, because force is a vector. So let's uh, actually define impulse in the x direction for now, and call that j sub x, where j is the traditional symbol for impulse for some reason. And it's equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of the force in this x direction, uh, dt. And so if you make a plot, of f sub x in newtons uh, versus the time in seconds, the force might go up for a while and then down for a while, usually. So if you integrate from t1 to t2, the area under that curve is, is what's called the impulse. So impulse has units of newtons times seconds, but you should be able to show that newtons times seconds is equivalent to kilograms meters per second, the unit for momentum. So the impulse momentum theorem states actually that uh, the change in a particle's momentum is equal to the impulse on it. So the delta P equals J. And one immediate example of that is that when a car is out of control, maybe uh, you've lost the use of the brakes, it's better to hit a haystack than a concrete wall. And the physics reason is that in each case, what you have is a truck going along, so you're the truck driver, you have some mass, you have some large velocity, uh, so you have some amount of momentum. Well, you have to stop. So the final momentum has to equal zero. So this, uh, the magnitude of your initial momentum equals the change in the momentum, um, which is going to equal the impulse, which is force times time. So if you hit the haystack, it takes a lot of time to plow through the haystack, so time is large, so the force that hits your truck can be a little less. If you hit a concrete wall, then the amount of time it takes to stop will be very short. That needs a very large force in order to imp impart the same amount of impulse. And that's what crashes up your, your, your truck. So next let's go over some of the basic vocabulary of collisions. So every collision or explosion involves a short intense interaction in which the external forces are usually negligible. That means that in collisions and explosions they conserve momentum. You can use an, uh, momentum before equals momentum afterwards. However, the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy of the system before and after is not generally conserved. So we classify all the different kinds of collisions based on uh, the kinetic energy, mostly. So uh, if the final kinetic energy is less than the initial kinetic energy, that's true for most collisions, we call that an inelastic collision. K final of total is less than the K initial. So where does that en energy go? Well, heat must have been created, or maybe there was some damage to the object, bending of materials that's absorbed some energy there. But the kinetic energy gets lost. Now, if for some reason the final kinetic energy is more than the initial kinetic energy, we call that an explosive collision. That's a little more rare. I'm going to call it an explosion. K final is greater than K initial, so there must have been some internal chemical or elastic energy, perhaps, that must have got released there. And then 
we'll finish, finish the chapter with when the final kinetic energy equals the initial kinetic energy, that's conservation of kinetic energy, that would be called an e elastic collision. And wait, that's three categories. The fourth one is actually a subcategory of inelastic. It's called uh, totally inelastic collision. So that's just if the two objects stick together in the end. So maybe there's Velcro or glue or they just got melded together somehow in the collision. Okay, let's see if you've got it. So uh, I want you to read through these four situations and classify them based on those four uh, categories that we just mentioned in the previous slide. So if you could take a pause, maybe rewind a little bit, uh, come up with your, your ideas, and then, um, and then I'll tell you what I think. Okay, so first one, two magnets approach their north poles facing the repel in reverse direction. So that's uh, and I, gonna be an elastic collision because nothing uh, was damaged or heated up. All you've got is that purely repulsive magnetic force. So I, I expect kinetic energy be, to be conserved there. Uh, a truck strikes a parked car. The two slide off together crumpled and entwined. So if they're entwined, that's a totally inelastic collision. Okay, they're stuck together. Basketball is dropped from 1.5 meters above the floor, but it bounces up to only 1.2 meters. So uh, we think that during the collision with the floor, some energy must have been lost, and that's called an inelastic collision. That's, again, very common. Maybe some heat was produced in the rubber or something. And last one, D, a toy containing a compressed spring is dropped from 1.5 meters above the floor, and when it hits the floor, it somehow that spring is released and it jumps up to a maximum height of 2.2 meters above the floor. That's what we call an explosive collision. Somehow, uh, just after it comes away from the floor, it has more kinetic energy than it did before because it came from the elastic energy in the spring. Okay, so totally inelastic collisions, uh, you can just uh, use conservation of momentum to figure them out. Um, basically, before the collision, you got m1 at some velocity v1, m2 at some velocity v2, and after the collision, they're stuck together. So one object with m1 plus m2, and that's going to have the uh, final velocity, which you can find from these initial. And the conservation of momentum equation reads m1 times v2, sorry, m1 v1 plus m2 v2 is the total mass times v final. You can solve that off for the components of v final. An example here, uh, you've got a cart going at 10 meters per second, it collides with another cart, uh, equal mass, and then they both end up going at 5 meters per second. So uh, conservation of momentum, basically before equals after. So before that, the first one, the green cart was at rest, so you just got 10 meters per second times the mass of the first one. Afterwards, they're, clunk, they're hooked together, so their mass is 2m uh, times v, whatever v is. You can solve out for v, and you get 5 meters per second. And a little smoke there is showing that there was some energy lost during the collision. Okay, so elastic collisions is the last section, 9.6. Uh, conserve both momentum and kinetic energy. So you've got m1 and v1 initial, uh, m2, v2 initial. After the collision, you've got m1, v1 final, and m2, v2 final. And the conservation laws are basically conservation of momentum and conservation of kinetic energy. So you simultaneously solve these two equations. And I want to start by actually assuming that everything's happening along the x-axis. So we'll do one-dimensional uh, elastic collisions. So we start by defining the x-axis towards the right. Uh, we'll draw uh, the situation before as mass 1 is moving to the right with v1i, and mass 2 is moving to the right with v2i. And we've uh, set them both with positive velocities there. And then afterwards, m1 is moving v1f, and m2 is moving v2 final. Okay, so from conservation of momentum equation is just uh, written as the momentum before equals the momentum after. We're going to call that equation M. And the conservation of kinetic energy equation, because this is an elastic collision, looks like that. The total uh, kinetic energy before equals the total kinetic energy after. We'll call that equation K. So 
if we multiply the kinetic energy equation on both sides by 2 and collect like terms of mass on both sides, the M equation becomes M1 times V1I minus V1F equals M2 times V2F minus V2I. And the kinetic energy equation becomes basically the same except with the, the V's all squared. So those are very different equations. We're going to use the fact that uh, in algebra a plus b times a minus b equals a squared minus b squared. That allows us to expand out those uh, v squared terms in the kinetic energy equation uh, as, as shown here. And then we can do a trick which is we can divide uh, the left side of equation uh, k by the left side of equation m and the right side uh, of equation k by the right side of equation m and set them both equal, we get v1 initial plus v1 final equals v2 final plus v2 initial. And rearranging that, you get v1 initial minus v2 initial equals the negative of v1 final minus v2 final. So what that means is that the relative speed of 1 and 2 is the same before and after an elastic collision, but the signs get reversed. So that's a really interesting fact, and we're going to use that uh, when we're looking at special cases. Uh, we can do a whole lot more algebra if we want, but I'm not going to do it on this screen. But you can solve for the final velocities of 1 and 2, and I like to do it in the initial rest frame of particle 2. So uh, we choose a frame in which uh, if uh, 1 is moving at vi1, v2i equals 0. In that case, this is your equation for the final speed of v uh, of particle 1 and this is the equation for the final speed of particle 2 both given in terms of the initial uh, velocity of particle 1 and their masses so those are really useful equations to have in your age sheet I'm gonna look at three special cases now the first special case is when m1 is much much less than m2 so that means m2 is your big guy and m1's mass is negligible. There's those two equations, so we can just cross off the m1's. Uh, so v1 final is just going to be negative v initial, uh, so it just reverses its direction. And v2 final, we've got basically m1 over m2, so it's zero, so no effect. So it just sits there. Second special case is m1 equals m2. In that case, uh, v1 final is going to be just the mass minus the mass, so 0 over 2m. That means that the object 1 will just stop. And v2 will be 2m over 2m, so just v initial. So it will pick up the same velocity that v1 or, or 1 originally had. So that's like Newton's cradle. And third special case is when m1 is much, much greater than m2. So in this case, m1 is the big guy and uh, m2 is negligible. So in our equations, we can just cross off the m2s. So in that case, v1 will be, uh, v1 final will just be equal to v1 initial, so it won't change its speed. It'll just keep going, clocking along. And v2 final turns out to be 2 times v initial. So that means that little object 2 uh, zooms away at twice the, the speed of v, v1. So they keep the same uh, relative speed before and after the collision, because it's elastic. Okay, so let's see if you've got it. Um, ball A is at rest on a level floor, and ball B collides elastically with ball A, and the two move off separately but in the same direction. What can you conclude about the masses of the balls? So I'll let you read through those answers, and then I'll tell you which one's correct. Press pause. Okay, so if they're moving off at the same direction, it must mean that ball B, the one that I uh, was originally moving uh, has greater mass than ball A. Uh, and that, that follows from that, that third equation that we, that we just derived. Okay, so we've been talking about collisions all in along the x-axis here uh, in which balls are colliding head-on. Um, but if they're not colliding head-on, if they are a little offset from each other, then this force will will cause them to have a y component of their their final velocity and so this is basically billiards okay so uh, it the 
the direction of these internal forces is determined by this parameter B, which we call the impact parameter. It's the distance between the sphere's centers uh, measured perpendicular to the initial velocity of, of this ball one. And that is the last part of chapter nine. I will see you in class.